What's up, everybody? Welcome to IGN Game Scoop. I'm your host, Damon Hatfield. Joining me this week is Justin Davis, Scoop, Tina Amini, and Sam Claiborne. Hey, everybody. Tina, are you still there? I didn't hear you say hi. Aw, can you not you hear go. me? Now, oh, now we can hear you. Now we can. Hi, hear you. everyone. It was, little, it was a little <laughs> bit clipped, but hello, hello. Uh, we've got a great show for you today. A little bit of a slow week, but that just means we have more time for your emails. Uh, so we've got lots of good emails <laughs> from you guys this week. Why is that funny? This, I just like I was thinking nothing. my week, and like my entire week was emails and Slack messages and stuff. <laughs> I don't have more time. Both emails, no, <laughs> not better these emails. Not it's these been ones. a very busy week at IGN. Uh, but there's just not as much video game news uh, happening this week. Everyone's taking a taking the the memorial. Of the a week long weekend off, I guess. Right. Uh, but let's begin with what we are playing. Uh, and I am in chapter 12 of Final Fantasy VII Remake. That's still good enjoying chapter. it. Still enjoying it. Still plan to keep playing it. Uh, from what I've played so far, I, you know, I'm not, I haven't finished the game, uh, but I am over halfway through. From what I've played so far, uh, Tom's score of an eight seems about right to me. That's about What's what chapter the game 12 is. again? Oh man, they they're they're at, they got to stop. Well, I don't want to spoil anything, but um, they're back in Sector Seven and trying to stop <laughs> a disaster from happening. Uh, they're, okay. climb, they're climbing the the, the thing. Yeah, really. Mm-hmm. Hard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Damon, what did you think of Wall Market in that whole section? Well, so that's that. I wanted to bring that up because you said that that was the best part of the game. Yeah, I think uh, so. And I thought it was you know cool, uh, but it didn't really stick out to me. I, I, when I got there, I wasn't like, oh my god, Justin was right, this is amazing. Yeah, I was curious I about that too. Did you guys like the arena, or what was it about that yeah. that people like? I, well, it's an iconic part of the original game that I think people are really excited to see remade. Um, and it's sort of the game at its silliest, you know, with all the climax of how that section of the game ends, and yeah. um, it's so over the top. And I think Wall Market itself is just very atmospheric, and I love how it's all just twisting alleys and like you know you it's deliberately designed to confuse you and make you lost and all the back alleys and um i i just i really really loved it and um it was like exactly what littler me pictured in my mind when i played the original <laughs> game but sort of blown up into hd and i i just thought they really did a really good job recreating that atmosphere okay yeah it felt like they made um some of the side quests harder to actually navigate in that area mm-hmm. like a the, in the slums when you're first like trying to chase down cats and kids and whatnot, which seems to be a recurring theme, they actually mm-hmm. highlight it on your map. They, they show you like UI of where you're supposed to go, but in Walmart, it's totally different. You have to kind of contextually go through stuff, slash lookup guides, which I may have done. IGN.com. <laughs> IGN.com has good guides. Good game it's help. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I guess uh, it, was, it was cool. And I, I do like how... Uh, um, at first, you sort of, you feel like you're getting lost within Wall Market, but then by the time you leave, I feel like I know my way around and I can get where I want to go. But I guess maybe I just I just have so little memory of playing the original Final Fantasy VII that I wasn't even like waiting for that moment to come up. You know? Yep, they're all very short segments in the original. Sam, where are you? Uh, I'm, I haven't played since we last talked. Um, wow, so oh, chapter week. fourteen or something. So you're catching up to me. Wow. You're trying I, to I, get I did to the re- break so you can catch up. Yeah, I'm just waiting for you, buddy. Cool, I did thanks. recreate the entirety of Free Gold Watch in Animal Crossing. Cool. What? Yeah. How many yeah. pinball yeah. machines do you have in there? About 63. Wow. <laughs> How much are they each? Like 10,000 bells at least? You know what's lucky is that the uh, pinball machines, I think, are 2750, but the arcade machines are 65,000. That's what it is. That's right. So like, I could do like five pinball machines a day and add it all up. But the arcade machines took a lot. But there's fewer arcade machines at Free Gold Watch. But I was pretty impressed with the outcome. If you would go to Free Gold Watch's uh, Instagram, they put up a video for their 14th anniversary. It's pretty wow. cute. It looks really good. Uh, I feel like 65000 is way more expensive than even the most expensive arcade cabinet of all time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, those, uh, there's like these uh, Star Wars sphere cabinets recently. Which uh, it was like, you, did you guys see those where you like sit down and it's like projecting on like the inside of a sphere? Uh, yeah. Those are like those are like twenty five thousand dollars, which is yeah. crazy. If you take the economic value of a bell versus a real life dollar, yeah. you know, considering you can grow those things on trees. Uh, first off, that's going to put the economy into turmoil. But yeah, second off, that reduces yeah. the value, so it's it's much cheaper. Actually, are bells really more like good. yen? That's uh, I think a bell translates to a yen because it's like a hundred bells I never for an about that. That makes sense. I never, yeah, yeah, I never tried to do the math on that. But there's also like, there's also just a boot <laughs> that you can sell. So I wouldn't think about it too much. Weed yeah. sells. Yeah. 
Coral. And some of the shells are worth a lot of a lot of bells. Sea bass. Did you guys see uh, PETA's going after Animal Crossing? Yeah, I heard that, but I didn't see yeah. it. Well, it's, there's like a, is it an owl that runs the museum? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They have a beef with the owl and his like fish catching. Oh, he hates bugs. Okay. Oh, something like that. Yeah. Something yeah. Like that. Uh, my daughter's yeah. favorite thing on this earth right now <laughs> is they play Animal Crossing with me and Blathers the owl who runs the museum sleeps during the day. He's an owl. He's nocturnal. And, um, and they always want me to go into the museum and wake him up because he gets this shocked. He goes, yeah. Bong, and then his eyes get really big. <laughs> he goes, who? Who? Do you have yeah. that reaction emoji for your uh, your avatar? Like, oh, that's a good question. I don't your know. Villager. Yeah. But they laugh and laugh and laugh and always want me to go wake up the owl. <laughs> you should do it with him. Take a screenshot. They'll love it. <laughs> the other really good reaction, one of my favorites ever, is uh, when you wake up Gulliver finally and he looks at his phone. And when he finds out his phone is broken, he says, oh, my gosh. <laughs> And it goes, dong. It's <laughs> become my least favorite thing because it takes five tries just yeah. to wake him up oh and then God. 15 lines of dialogue. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. slowly moving into Damon's camp now. This is what happens oh, when you, you. Uh, book what, you what you've been playing. <laughs> so, Sam, you've been playing Animal Crossing instead of Final Fantasy. Yeah, I got sucked back in. Okay. You know, a bunch of friends just got it too because Switches are kind of coming back in stock and they're around. Mm. So, like, Really? That's been funny. I'm like, come to my town. I'm like, your town's all tense. No. Yeah. You live in a shanty town. Like. <laughs> and uh, Tina, you already beat Final Fantasy VII. So have you been playing anything else? No, nothing. Not even Animal Crossing. I'm playing oh the gosh. game of life. Mm-hmm. Not that's, the board game. Although the board game is good. That's the least exciting game. I found yeah. that but board game's fun to take out and put down on the ground and look at. And then look at all the stuff in it, but then it's not fun to play. Hmm. Yeah, I love everything after, about life. After yeah. hour one, I love life actually. Like that's a great yeah. board game. They had like a PC version many years ago that I was obsessed with for a while. It was pretty Whoa. true to to its uh to its original. So it's pretty. It's hardcore. I recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> and then Justin, you still pick crossing? Yeah, but I was gonna talk about something else. I am yeah. playing Final Final Fantasy thirteen. Yeah, whoa, 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 whoa. Twist. <laughs> Who? Uh, no, we talked about it That's on the good. show. I followed through on, I think it was maybe two weeks ago on Scoop. Uh, mm-hmm. I talked about how some people are criticizing Final Fantasy VII for how linear it was, but that appealed to me because it's more of a chill game where it just sort of tells you where to go next and what to do next. Mm-hmm. And that made me think of thirteen. That's what everybody hated about that game. And um, two things. One, it's completely not an exaggeration. It is literally, literally like walk in a straight line, fight. <laughs> and then the fight, I usually just select auto battle. And then and then a cutscene. And like that's been like the first six hours of that game. So it's like all the criticism of 13 is totally fair. But for me, like I'm literally playing the game lying down. Like it's, it's super chill. And like, they're setting up this mystery that I'm like pretty invested in and their game's still really, really beautiful on my PC in 2020. And Mm. you know, the music's really good. So it's like, if you treat it a little bit more of like a visual novel, it's just like, I'm going to relax and just like go on this adventure that the game takes me on. Like it's, I'm really enjoying it, but, um, but (laughs) it is a little bit indefensible in its design for sure. Have you been spending all of your uh, multitasking time then? Eating snacks with uh, the other hand? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got to figure out if I can advance the (laughs) dialogue with the (laughs) left finger. Yeah, or the D-pad. I didn't Um, know that game was on PC, though. Yeah, Yeah, it's on PC, and the port's not very good. Like, I had to do some, Hmm. you know, PC gaming trickery to get it running. But, um, but it, it, you know, up-reses to HD just sort of, like, automatically, so the game looks really pretty and beautiful. Hmm. Lightning is a cool character. Yeah. Like lightning. Yeah. The rest of the party kind of sucks. <laughs> Sa- Saz is cool. Uh, I'll, well, I'll, I'll, I'll report back more later. Okay, good. In addition to Final Fantasy VII, I've been playing another game that I'm actually much more excited about. It is amazing. I have found a truly amazing Super Damage game. It is called The Eternal Castle. It was out on PC, I think, last year. Now it's on Switch. And I'm going to show you guys... Uh, trailer because what's so cool about this game is what it looks like it has the coolest art style i've seen in a long time you said it's pc cool. and switch yep awesome it's called the eternal castle so this is it and what it is it's a cinematic platformer like uh out of this world 
or flashback mm. or Prince of Persia. And uh, this is what it looks like. This is what the whole game looks like. And it has like all these like eerie horror sections. It's awesome. I love I just love the look of this game. I think the whole playthrough only takes like 90 minutes. So I actually want to have it just as like a movie that I can like put on and watch sometimes because it looks so cool. Is it a point and click type game? No, it's a no, no, no. It's like a cinematic platformer. You move through these environments left and right. You know, there's some combat, this really basic combat, and then some light puzzle solving, and you can affect the environment. And But the real draw, I feel, is just like how cool the game looks. Yeah. Is there a run button? Oh. Whoa. There is that a run and a walk. Awesome. I know. There's a run and a walk button and a crouch button. What, what's a walk button? Well, you have like a medium gate that's like normal run, and then there's a slow walk button, and then there's a fast run button. I Okay. It's like, you know, pushing all the way forward wanna, on the thumbstick. Yeah, if you don't want to move too fast, if you want to, no. there's a spooky haunted house section of the game. Yeah. If you're yeah. just trying to take it in your environment, you know, take life <laughs> yeah. at a slow pace. <laughs> I've never heard of a walk button before. <laughs> you know uh, what needed a walk button it was uh, Red Dead Redemption 2. Uh, it needed a walk off- button? Yeah, yes. Because it has a walk button. Because there's like, <laughs> I think there's anyway. six walk buttons. <laughs> I highly recommend the Eternal Castle to two groups of people. Group A would be people that like cinematic platformers like Out of This World, Flashback, Prince of Persia, Inside Limbo. Group two, people that can appreciate a game purely for its uh, cool art style. I love. Until you love added Inside and Limbo in there, nobody likes those games anymore. They're so hard to play. Well, I about, still like those games. What about group three, people who like horror? Yeah, horror. Yeah, except... Yes, except there's only one. You, there's like four different worlds, and only one of them mm. is a horror world. Mm. So it's not a horror game all the way through. Yeah. yeah. And group four, just daemons. Just daemons. <laughs> 10 out of 10 daemons are going to really get a kick out of this game. Um, and finally, I want to note, I'm really happy that Panel Dupont is on Switch now through the uh, Nintendo online service. Yeah, I got I to gotta yeah. play it. Yeah, That's it's Tetris super fun. Attack, but without, it's Tetris, yeah. without Yoshi or Tetris. Yep. The menus are in Japanese, but it's pretty easy to, you know, maneuver them, get into a single player game. I think what I really like is the versus mode, because that's where you yeah. go and play against specific characters, like moving through levels. The There's versus whole, like, when you're playing another person is really frustrating for that other person if they don't know that game, because it's like, you know, well, yeah. so you have to learn each puzzle. I and mean, that one has this very specific technique by which you just screw over the other person. And if one person knows that, it's not fun to play with them. No, yeah. we uh, like panel, panel upon and Tetris Attack are amazing. Some of the best puzzle games ever made, but they are not intuitive and obvious in the way that, like, you know, I don't know, like Tetris no. is, or like Columns is. It's definitely oh, a skill boy. you have to learn. They're yeah. more intuitive than Wario's Woods. That game makes zero <laughs> sense. That's true. I, pl- I played for many, many years. I played a MMO called Puzzle Pirates, where it was a bunch of people that got together and crewed a pirate ship, and each station on the ship was a different puzzle mini game. So if you ran the bilge station, like keeping the ship afloat and stopping it from flooding, you were basically playing like Bejeweled. Um, mm. and Is there a cat co- appearance about to happen? What? Is there a what now? Okay. Oh, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, I tried to get her too. Okay. <laughs> no, I, sensed, I sensed a cat off camera for a little bit. There. <laughs> they, uh, the combat in Puzzle Pirates was paneled upon. It was a uh, cool. from t- Tetris attack. And so it was sword fighting and you would have to drop the swords down and get big combos and Oh, that's eliminate, cool. eliminate your foes it was the best. It's also the same game as Pokemon Puzzle League. Yep. On handhelds. Pokemon Puzzle cool. League was on Nintendo 64. Well, it's also on Game Boy Color. That's like that's where I know it from, at least. Yeah. Okay, let's check in with the listeners. Hi. Hey listeners. Listeners, remember you can always reach us at the email address gamescoop at IGN.com, just like Scott. Langley and Lacey Washington did. Says, Dear Goose Campers, with the current COVID situation hindering the recording of audio and motion capture for new games, do you think we will see studios change course to develop even more remasters than what we've been seeing lately? That's interesting to think that uh, developers or publishers would pivot into remastering more games if they can't, if, if their current you know games they're working on get delayed. First of all, the cat's here now, so. Yeah, okay. I made it happen. Just yeah, so you know. Oh, there's a little cat face. Um, 
So I, I, when you first were bringing up this topic, I was thinking like, oh, why, why would it be any easier, you know, remotely to make a remaster than anything? But I was thinking of like the full remakes where they really up everything and they do a bunch of work. But like a lot of games just need a, you know, a fresh coat of paint and be thrown in a collection with others. So yeah, I'm sure those are easier because those are basically ports. Well, and like Although, we just got, go ahead, Tina. Tony Hawk. Mm-hmm. That's that a big say? remake. Yeah, but if you, you know, they they talked a lot about how they actually use motion capture to make sure that they're creating, like, realistic, um, yeah. you know, characters and whatnot and, like, really adding a good visual style that's that is realistic. And, like, mm-hmm. mocap is going to be the thing that's really hard to do yeah, right now. You so. can't do that, right? Exactly. So it depends, like, if people want a really polished remaster that uses, like, current technology um, and design mechanisms, like, it, it might still be the same scenarios as any other game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but then you do have to like the people are beating down EA's door for a Mass Effect, you know, trilogy remaster, yep. you know, among other things, yep. and they, you know, they're not <laughs> for whatever reason they're not delivering it. You know, they clearly have other plans in mind. Um, but maybe this will maybe this will uh, force them to change their tune. <laughs> oh boy! So you, good. Uh, okay. so. Yeah, EA is sitting on a lot. I would love a, a Dead Space remaster. If you're audio only, you probably need to watch the episode on YouTube this week. <laughs> if you like mm-hmm. uh, I'd love a Dead Space remaster. I'd love Burnout's remaster of yeah. any of those uh, original games. Um, I don't know. If Capcom wanted to remaster uh, Beautiful Joe 1 and 2, I would totally play those again. Outside and like we just... Arcade, yeah. Sure. We just got um, Saints Row the Third remastered, and it actually kind of sounds like that's kind of a, a, a cheap remaster based on uh, McCaffrey's Review, so yeah, and I don't know that that one was planned already before the pandemic, but I could definitely see publishers looking at their older IPs, thinking about what could we what could we get out the door. Well, and that was tied to the uh, Nintendo fashion. rumor that I think we talked about last week, where there could be Mario remasters this year, right? That's true. Like, that would yep. be a top of my list. Would be like a really cool widescreen, you know, high res Mario sixty four. I would play through it start to finish right away. Yeah, there same with Sunshine. Anything. There's a widescreen mod for Mario 64 out there now. I don't know if you've seen the videos. Yeah, There's yeah a, the a, PC versions uh, are amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but it's not a it's a PC port, um, so different than like you know emulation. Sure. Um, yeah, it, it's a bummer to think about games being delayed as a result of this. Of course, it's inevitable. We talked last week about how you know like orchestras can't get together to record orchestral scores yeah. and you know yeah. motion capture and like game programming and art to like varying degrees are like, you know, can be done in work from home offices. But um, I don't know. It's sad. It's like, there's hmm. not this immediate impact. Like there is, you know, like filming of television and movies which shut down. Right. Like, mm-hmm. but the games industry is going to have this sort of delay knock on effect. Um, so yeah, maybe we'll start to feel that more in 2021. Bummer. I think likely we'll start to see more of a surge in like, you know, independently made games and maybe more of a focus on them because they're doing more mm-hmm. of that like barrage style development anyway, where mm-hmm. they already have their rigs at home. They don't need to think about like, do, how do I upgrade, uh, you know, my, my work set up at home? Do I go into the office? Do I get it shipped from there? Like, how does that stuff operate? And they're a smaller scale team. So the collaboration was probably done over the Internet anyway. Um, like a couple of my game developer friends that are part of a smaller group, like an independently formed group. It's just they've noticed that the work from home setup is beneficial as opposed to for like a triple A scale level game where they they are doing things like mocap and bringing in actors to be right next to one another for this stuff is more difficult to pull off that level of production. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually talked to a uh, a friend of mine who works at a at a triple A studio and she was talking about how they're doing mocap in a way where they book the person, the person, and this is in another country, goes mm. to the studio, and then the studio, you know, people are on the other side of glass and stuff either. Mm. If there's just one yeah. person, and they're able to actually start working through it. It's just like it's slower and stuff like that. But like that's like to get to keep a major game on schedule. And I thought that was interesting that they, they worked it out. I don't think most of the United States is ready for that yet, but maybe you know, European countries and Canada and stuff like that are starting to work it out. Yeah, I heard that's what they're doing with uh, symphonies too. They have like the first chair flute mm-hmm. come in by themselves and just record their part, and then the second chair flute comes in and records their part. Oh. That was well, that was just, that well, was yeah. just a, that was just a joke. No one's. Yeah. You I can't thought, do that. There's not a big <laughs> demand for symphony recordings right now either. I just want to point that out. It's not like everybody's like, "What is the new version of Beethoven's Fifth coming out?" No, no, no. no. Video games use video games use symphonic orchestras all the time. Yeah, that's true. 
I think they use uh, uh, they can they can use like cool MIDI stuff. Um, okay, moving on. This is Brian from Austin, Texas. And he wants to know if we could send one modern game back in time for your childhood self to play, what would it be? It's a really good question. I thought about yeah. it a lot. It kept you up all night. It did. I thought about it last night a lot. Um, it, I have a lot of answers to this. One's, uh, first, I started with like games I would have liked as a kid because I really liked Final Fantasy 1 and then I hmm. liked Final Fantasy 2, which we call 4 now a lot. Those are like probably my favorite games when I was a kid. But before that, I liked Super Mario Brothers. So I think about that. But then I thought, you know what I got really robbed of is Minecraft. Everybody I know grew up wow. with Minecraft and loves it. And if I would have had that as a kid, like Legos are my favorite thing. And but by the time Minecraft came out, I was like, this is not interesting for me. But if as a kid, I would have loved it. And my nephew's playing it now. And I talked to him about it. And I'm like, man, this is like his like favorite thing. And it's like so fun for him. And I'm like, I would have loved this. That's cool. Would not have expected that answer. Yeah. Yeah. But but then again, like, I don't like a lot of the games I played as a kid now. So maybe I would have grown up and moved past Minecraft. I mean, that's fine. Right. It's just I know I would have liked it as a kid. Hmm. Kind of on a similar trajectory and did not stay up all night thinking about it. So this is very like cursory level of thought that I put into this. But I was thinking about the same line of thought of um, what did I like as a kid? What did I like spending my time doing? And it'd be, you know, an immediate come home from school, run downstairs, you know, can't wait to play, pick up from my my save spot again. Um, and like something like Red Dead 2, especially of the fidelity of today back then would have blown my mind. Yeah. And the fact that there was so much, like I had more time back then. So uh, for Red Dead 2, uh, what was it, 2018 that it came out? Um, I burned through that game in a week. And it's because we have to, you know, do work on that kind of stuff. I hosted our spoiler cast for it. So I was kind of under a certain level of, of a deadline. But if I were in high school, let's say, uh, and able to run downstairs to my basement and pick up on my save, I think that would have been the thing that would have carried me through like weeks of enjoyment. And I would have probably spent more time discovering more side quests and like mm -hmm. more NPCs and more of these random events and whatever else than I did in the one week that I burned through that game. Yeah, probably I would have also played RDO too because I never played that. Oh yeah, well, yeah, briefly, but yeah, that's a really good point. Anything with an online component, like I would have played the crap out of as a kid, even though that didn't even exist when I was a kid. And yeah. like now, like Fortnite is a good example of that. I mean, like that's like a big zeitgeisty game that like every kid knows. And like there weren't games like that outside of Super Mario Brothers when we were kids. And yeah, Super Mario Brothers is great, but. But especially something like, you know, a World of Warcraft online kind of uh, mm -hmm. multiplayer game where there's so much to explore and like actual uh, mm -hmm. communities to partake in and random events and whatnot. Um, so the same thing for RDO, like I probably would have spent so much time in it, but it, it's something that I can't appreciate as much because I'm just have I have limited time and I've got to go from one game rapidly to the next. Mm -hmm. For Red Dead, you don't would have learned a lot about life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But little kids play these games like seriously, little kids are playing Grand Theft Auto, which I think is a another level past uh, Red Dead even. Yeah. And they're it learning the ways of the world. Yeah, it would have also been kind of prophetic because a uh, personal information moment. Um, I actually had tuberculosis uh, like people still get that these days. Uh, and it's I think like my doctor told me one in three Americans do. And you, you have antibiotics now and it takes nine months of brutal antibiotics. But I think if I played that game and seen uh, the existence, I'm trying not to, to say too much, but if I saw the yeah. existence of that yeah. disease play out in that game, it might've terrified the shit out of me following that. Yeah. <laughs> that was a really good spoiler workaround. Like 10 out of 10. That <laughs> I was tried. really good. Just like the game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> spoiler workaround. <laughs> Justin, how about you? Yeah, my answer is similar to Tina's where like I was trying to think about games that would have blown my little mind as a child. So like, uh, you know, something like God of War from 2018 popped into mind. Like if you were to send that game back in time, it would just feel like a miracle that shouldn't exist. Um, yeah. Breath of the Wild was another one I thought about. Um, but then I had another thought of what well, the question was phrased is you can send one game back, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so if you were to send Breath of the Wild back to me when I was like eight, it would kind of ruin video games. Well, there's that like, too, yeah. Oh, I wouldn't <laughs> want to play Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, like <laughs> Twilight Princess. Like, oh, get out of here with these. So there's an yeah. argument that like maybe it's like a it's like a monkey's paw wish situation where you actually can kind of ruin video games for yourself if you're not careful. Unless yeah. it was inspirational to other developers at the time and actually it just evolved the trajectory of design work people did, and we would have been in a very different place 
in 2020. Yeah. Imagine the the Zelda game that would have come out in 2020 were yeah. Breath of the Wild to come out when you were a kid. Yeah, now now we're in like Back to the Future. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah. you, you, I guess I guess you're not ready for this yet. If, it, if, if Breath of the Wild was sent back to me as a kid, I'd be like, "There's no way there's a game on this thing." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I thought I wouldn't send back anything with dual analog sticks because I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to play it. Yeah, we like, had to yeah, learn those like progressively, yeah. but now kids like. Are, are even past that they have to learn them anyway progress like uh, in, because they, they just only use touch screens yeah. so like dual analog is always going to be confusing there's this one generation that was like yeah. kind of like <laughs> born into it pretty funny yeah so i would send back like a modern version of the games i was playing back then uh that would still be super impressive to me i'd send back like dead cells or inside or spelunky something 2d but that still you know is uh, several measures beyond what uh, an NES could could have provided me, and still would have been amazing. You know, more impressive than even what a Super Nintendo could do. Yeah, yeah. I think any of the Mario games, because we grew up playing Mario games, would be cool because yeah. they were always just an evolution. And even Mario Odyssey, like I could have figured that out. It's not that far off from Mario Three, which is a game I played, like Tina saying, for probably two years. <laughs> but also then like, you wouldn't yeah. appreciate certain elements because i think you look at mario odyssey and there's like little references like ways that you can see it evolve so like there's a different level of appreciation having lived through the entirety of that franchise mm-hmm. but i could have still yeah. named all the koopa kids naming like if you sent back a game from the future that had references to old mario games but those old mario games were still newer <laughs> than what you had sent yeah. back in the past you'd be like why like why is mario wearing these vacation clothes what's people, what's flood would people even like what the golf if we played it when we were kids yeah yeah exactly yeah probably not it. it would just be confusing yeah, yeah like why does this why the levels keep changing yeah. <laughs> all right this is wes from north carolina he says hello games cooped up crew i have a question about music in games are there any songs that immediately make you think about a specific game or a gaming-related moment in your life? When I was a kid, my older sister and I shared a playroom. The agreement was I could play, I could use the TV to play Super Nintendo if I muted the sound, and she could use her boombox to listen to music. Mm. Looking back, this makes me sad because I didn't understand the importance or impact of soundtracks in games. But that being said, I still can't hear certain in-sync songs without thinking of Donkey Kong Country 2. Oh, man. Yeah, I didn't think that was the way this question was going to go. But I absolutely, you know, when you're a kid and you, and you first start listening to pop music or p- the radio, uh, mm-hmm. which is, you know, not around anymore. But if kids, that was like what a, a Spotify was back in the day. Um, but <laughs> <Spotify>. uh, yeah, <laughs> um, you, I, I used to play Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and every and listen to the radio. That was like when I was first listening, watching MTV and stuff. And like every song, like 90s song from that time, like that's not rock and roll because it's been like pop music. I'm. I can't even name artists now, like, but uh, it would be I, whenever you hear that stuff, I always think of Sonic, just Genesis and pop music from 1992. So early 90s pop music. Yeah, so, but like, I thought C- you were going to go with, Music like, Factory. Um, yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, I thought you were going to go with like songs that are in games that make you think of games. So like when mm-hmm. I think of like I think it's Flock of Seagulls. Did I, I ran so far away? Yes. When I hear that or like Gary Newman's Here in My Car, I just think of Vice City. Like yeah. I think it was in the ads for that game. Yeah, probably. What does Freebird make you think of? I can't think of a game that that's in. What do you mean? It's like well, a like rock band. Exactly. Yeah, it's, that's the only kind of association I could <laughs> think of where a song makes me think of a game because I've never replaced the soundtrack or like had music in the background. Like I was trying to think about arcade experiences, but mm. no like consistent song that would have created like, like maybe rock develop. Band? Yeah, oh, yeah, or yeah. It was. I, I, was I guess I played that over and over. Weezer yeah, that's fair. and the, the Yeah Yeah Yeahs and what else? I get yeah, that first Rock Band man. I so I was completely oh. on like all of the songs in Rock Band make me think of Rock Band for sure. In Bloom from Nirvana. In that Bloom. Like, that's yeah. like one of the first songs that was unlocked. The easy ones you hear so much more than the others. That's why I think of that Weezer song. Yeah, for sure. Just Buddy Holly. I, think was I can't remember. Yeah. Say it ain't so probably. Say it ain't mm. so. Jeez. There are some goofy ones though. There was like a, a Highway Star was one, and like I I don't know that song outside of Rock Band. Dude, well, the total like, number, the total number of songs that like ended up being available for Rock Band is just insane. Yeah, yeah. exactly what I was gonna say. There's like hundreds of songs. They continued their licensing thousands like thousands for years. Of songs. 
Yeah. Yeah. Didn't they did, didn't they make that weird change though where when Rock Band 1 became Rock Band 2, like you didn't really get any Rock Band 1 songs and it was like shitty. And then from there on out though, they I think they were pretty good about keeping your library intact. Yeah, I don't I don't remember. Well, they used to have weekly like, DLC where they're like five more songs available for Rock Band and then they eventually yeah. just like opened it up and they're like, "Nah, we just have 5,000 songs now, but you know, buy <laughs> oh what God. you want." It's true. It's so crazy. Uh Tina, Justin, any other uh sort of like music moments that you relate with games? I thought about it. I don't I my memory growing up is I was generally listening like I didn't have the volume muted listening to pop music. Like I yeah. I listened me and my friends listened to a lot of Andrew WK and playing like, you know, Super Smash Brothers Melee in high school for sure. But um but no, <laughs> like I was generally appreciating the in game sound. Same yeah. here. I think it's the vice versa scenario where a game will remind me of one of its songs. Like I'll, I'll remember mm-hmm. a specific song in accordance with, with it. Hmm. Here's, here's something weird. My first CD player was my Sega CD and it has like a CD player mode. So you'd put music in, you know, music CD in, and then you would like on your television with your Genesis controller, select like play and pause and repeat and like stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I definitely associate like that era. Like that was the era where you'd get this this ad, and this was this worked, where you could get like you know ten CDs for ten cents. Do you guys remember yeah. those? Yeah, yeah, they had to cancel right away. away. Yeah. yeah, then you had to cancel, or they'd charge you thirty bucks each month for a CD. But it yeah. worked, and you could do it for like the whatever it was BMG, and you could do it yeah. for like another one, and then like you could do that. You get like 10, 12 free CDs all the time. And like, boy, like I remember like Nirvana's Nevermind and like early Pearl Jam stuff. Like that whole era was like my Sega CD played all that stuff. And I thought that they got, so I definitely associate with that. It's just the Sega CD had terrible games. So I don't also associate, and you couldn't play them at the same time. So I don't associate it with the games. Just the concept. Yeah, we, I have a remarkably similar, like, yeah, my very first CD player was a Sega CD. And my first two CDs were Bob Marley Legend and Green Day Dookie. <laughs> Oh yeah, and I listen to I listen to Dookie on my to, through my TV speakers a, a, a lot. I definitely listen to Dookie on my uh, Sega CD as well. Um, my friend Richie designed the cover art for that. Oh, cool! That's good cover art, and it's big. Yeah. It's really big. Good album. Yeah. Um, I the only uh, music sort of uh, memory I have because I, I also usually always listen to in, in game music, uh, but I went through a brief phase in high school. I guess I was a little angsty um, and our second television in our house was in my parents' bedroom. And I was, so I would go in there and play Sega Genesis. I'd play shining force one and two and I would turn off the lights and I'd listen to Tom, two, two albums, Tom Petty's wildflowers and uh, live through this by hole. Okay. Whoa. And play shining think... force one and two in the dark and listen well, to those two albums. Wildflowers has the last dance with Mary Jane on it. Right. So that's your angsty song on that. I don't know if it's actually on that album because it was part of uh, or I, I got, like free fallen and stuff. I, I had that album too, but I thought when I, when I got it, I got it as one of those 10 CDs for 10 cents. And I was like, I don't like this, but uh, definitely I, think, I don't think I ever owned a whole record, but like every song in those whole records was a single. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's a great album. I think last chance was Mary Jane was written just for his greatest hits album. If mm. I remember that correctly. Okay. Anyway, I have, I have one more that probably doesn't count, but What's I that? associate left for dead with silence. Because I would have to keep it on. I think it came out when I was in like high school or something. So I'd be in my bedroom at like 2 a.m. playing this thing. And I needed it to be on mute. So my parents wouldn't hear and see that I'd be playing in the middle of the night. Hmm. I'd sometimes have Whoa. to like, you know, turn my TV off and pretend like I was sleeping the whole time. They knew. <laughs> I'm sure think, they did. Um, <laughs> that reminded me that uh, I think uh, the Portal song uh, by Jonathan Colton was probably the most popular piece of pop music ever from a video game. Like that was so huge. It was just yeah. everywhere. The yeah, that was really good. soundtrack is amazing. Yeah, th- there's other good music in Portal too. That's a good point. Yeah. Okay, this is Jay from Buffalo, New York. It says, hey, Omega Cops, I was wondering what happened to Sega? Most companies stick with their IPs and keep pushing out sequels. As for Sega, it seems they barely make games anymore, and all their best IPs have been made by other developers like Sonic Mania, Panzer Dragoon, and Streets of Rage. Will Sega ever revisit classics like Sega Rally, Crazy Taxi, Jet Set Radio, Daytona USA, Virtua Fighter, House of the Dead, Sega Bass Fishing, Vector Man, Shinobi, Knights, and tons more? Thanks, guys. <laughs> Listening to your show has made many, many miles of running fly by. The uh, the Seaman disrespect <laughs> will not stand. 
Uh, no, I, I do think about this a lot. You know, there's been other uh, game developers, obviously, y- you know, Midway, Acclaim, you know, Konami, like the list goes on and on of developers that have fallen off and they're either gone or like a shell of their former selves. But like Sega really stands out to me because like they almost they almost won. Like they did it for a while. They were at like the top of like the video game software and hardware pile. And like to see them sort of fall from grace and not be able to recapture yeah. that is like you know, a major bummer. Like, for as much as I make fun of <laughs> Sonic the Hedgehog on this show, like, I was a Genesis kid growing up. I was not a Super Nintendo kid. And so it's um, it, it's really crazy seeing how their two paths have diverged and where Nintendo is today and where Sega is today. Um, you, you would, you, No one would have guessed that in 1991. Yeah. When you look true. back at those, like, really early days of Sega and this, just 90 to 2000, you know, kind of pre-Dreamcast, uh, they were really like they were Sonic, they were marketing, and they were sports games, and that's why they're in like every single house. And the stuff that they had that was really interesting that Sega kids got into, like the RPGs and stuff like that, like those really never were popular. So like the sports games and the Sonic games, and then their marketing campaign, like were like all huge. And then the Dreamcast came out, and that wasn't very popular, but the games were really good for it. And I didn't play any of those because their marketing was bad. And nobody wanted to play Sega anymore. And then everything just didn't work out for them. Like I've never played a Crazy Taxi game, but I hear they're good. But like I don't know if that coming back is going to change the world. Like it, it's just like it, they had these like blip games. Yeah, they yeah. they didn't survive. Sorry, Tina. They didn't survive the transition to 3D the way that the way that Nintendo did. Like Nintendo yeah. found a way to continue keeping Mario and Zelda. Like they're they're really different. They're super different games in 3D than they were in 2D. But they made it work in a way that Sega, like Sega's obviously making great 3D games now. But like Sonic didn't quite get there, and they really stumbled around that transition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like ultimately, the, I was going to say the same thing. Basically, it's it's just a business. You know, it's I think we see a lot of commentary online. It's like, why wouldn't they just do this? Like, this is clearly the easiest answer, you know, solution to all of their business problems. And it's as easy as just doing this remaster or like doing a sequel to this game. And uh, there's just so many factors at play, like from marketing departments mm-hmm. to maybe like, you know, creative disagreements among le- amongst leads, you know, d- uh, deals that are being struck with other companies. So it's just a myriad thing, amount of things that can possibly go wrong or where they make different decisions that flop. Nintendo has been through their own floppy decisions, um, but they've managed to bounce back. So it's like you have to uh, identify where you've had missteps and figure out like what strategies you're going to shift to from there. I think like the Wii U is a really big learning um, area for uh, for Nintendo, but the Switch was definitely born out of the Wii U. So they found success in failure, and that's the that's the yeah. way you survive. Yeah, Nintendo's internal studio is the best game development studio in the world like up there with rockstar and cd project like there's just not that much out there that that has such a good record um i think nintendo's easily the best and sega never really developed that that developer platform that they they made great games for their dreamcast and then when they said we're going to make games for everybody else it's not like they really stood out as this big developer or really invested in that i'm surprised by that i don't know why that is and there's not big creative names associated with sega that's kind of sad i don't know why that is it's weird right you know the names that were associated with them you know aren't there anymore they you know that's they let the them problem. leave or- yep. Yuji Naka yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. That's exactly it. So in 2004, uh, Sega was taken over by Sammy. Uh, and then it was revealed that Sega had been operating at a loss for almost a decade. They hadn't made any money in almost a decade. Uh, so Sammy decided to focus more on the parts of the business that were actually making money, which is the arcade business. Sega operated arcades and then made arcade machines. And then around that same time, well, they it lost was an their- easy decision to make. <laughs> they lost they lost their key talent like Yuji Naka and uh what Yu Suzuki. So it would literally be like Miyamoto leaving Nintendo, you know. Yeah. 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 Um so, so then it's I like I like to just, imagine that I know a little bit about business. Like I run a not crazy small part of IGN's business and I've been around the world a little while. How do you run a business for a decade? <laughs> How are they paying their bills? Like literally, where does the money come from That's after like, nine <laughs> years of losses to like continue even having I don't know. employees? I guess- because you made that enough crazy, money. Generous burn rate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you made enough money in the early nineties. Yeah, or you know they have loans from banks. Like, but yeah, it's it's yeah. still crazy. It's actually just a Ponzi scheme. And then I guess for like all these IP that Jay from Buffalo mentions, I guess I would just guess that you know they're not quite as strong or as beloved as you think they are. Um, there has been a few crazy taxis after the Dreamcast, but I don't think they were well received. It's a it's a free to play mobile game now. 
They released Jet Set Radio HD in 2012 to mixed reviews. Uh, House of the Dead is always more of an arcade game. There is a new arcade game released in 2018 that's in arcades. Vector that's Man a game that could have been reinvented as like a really cool survival horror series. Or like a, yeah, like that, you know, or VR. Never I, updated. Yeah, I don't think there's a VR version of it yet, even though that that seems to make sense. Vector Man was only ever on the Sega Genesis, you know, it never went beyond that, and it was sort of it was it's impressive at the time. It was what impressive it for its animation. Cat? Yeah. So I don't know. And then there's like Shinobi. They made a, a 3D Shinobi game for nin- Nintendo 3DS. Yeah. But no I never thought Ninja that. games would come back in any other way than like Ninja Gaiden, but like there's an era of Dark Souls y Ninja games now, which people really like. So yeah, I think that's true. Yeah, it, you know, it's very easy to play armchair armchair developer like Tina said. Sure. Like, clearly, if you would have just done this, but like, there's no denying that like some of those uh, some of that IP and some of those franchises have been like a little bit mismanaged, or there's missed opportunities there to have reinvented them in the yeah. modern era. But we should also note, I think Sega's doing much better today um, yeah. than it has in a long time, uh, thanks to Yakuza and uh, the Sonic they- the Hedgehog movie was well received. They own what do you call it? The creative assembly is that right? The Total War yeah. Games or all that? Oh, they, so yeah. And then the the Two Point Hospital developer they actually bought. And yeah. did um, you guys see the Sonic movie? I didn't see no. it. No, nobody's seen think, it. I yeah. think people liked it. I think people liked it. Are we required to watch that for Game Scoop? You That's are actually... required. You're required to not watch it. Oh. If you ever watch it, you're not allowed to be on. You're off the show. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Damon, I'm glad you brought that up though, because you know we've been talking about them a little bit in like you know almost postmortem terms. But like Sega, yeah. like Yakuza, it's amazing, and it's one of my yeah. favorite things. They've been around since before this generation, but the resurgence yeah. and popularity of Yakuza is like one of the stories of this generation that I, you know, is sort of tickled me and pleased me the most. And although Total War isn't my thing, like I know that those games are really beloved and continue to be incredibly popular on the PC. So. And also, yeah. Street, Streets of Rage 4 is really, really good. And they were smart enough to just let this other studio who had a lot of love for the franchise make that sequel. And it turned and, out great. So. Well, and Sonic Mania was similar, right? Where exactly. like, they took fans making a Sonic fan game um, you know, and, and turned it into something official. Like, yeah. So, so pretty, Sega's so doing... Savvy moves. Sega's doing much better than like Konami, which is literally just sitting on beloved IP that they're not doing anything with. Uh, one more email to get through before we get to video game 20 questions. This is from Tom and Tom has a simple but important question. What made you fall in love with video games? Uh, it's a big question, Damon. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I know you asked that kind of later on, but I, I, I have to think about it a little bit. I mean, I think we were kind of lucky to be in a place in our, in our generation uh we have never not had video games like there yep. was just not really an option like they were just around and so they were just a That's thing like movies yourself, or TV. yeah was it different for you yeah when you have strict as hell parents or oh. like against screens and whatever else and your best access to it is the road the you know begrudging road trips you take to boston where at least your cousin has a bunch of games or <laughs> They barely let you play because it's all the, you know, the older cousins and brothers that are occupying the controller time. But still, you can fall in love with games in this way. How did you fall in love with them? A um, couple different moments. Uh, and a lot of it was like over the shoulder of my brothers and cousins playing. But uh, I remember like specific elements. I've talked about um, GoldenEye uh, on, on GameScoop before. Uh, that they actually let me play because there's more, you know, controllers. There's more people that you can play with. And I got really good at it. And I think... Um, you know, being able to put my brothers in their places uh, on a game where they were just sort of like inherently think that they would be better at it than I was, was something that uh, made me really fall in love with that particular game. It's also just like a bonding experience with everybody. Um, And then uh, I remember watching my brother play Ragnarok and I thought it was so magical. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm rewatching Lord of the Rings and I'm thinking the same thing about uh, just the magic that it, it sort of instills in you. Um, there's literal magic in Ragnarok, but it was like this big open world and it seemed like this really beautiful environment and I just really wanted to live in it. I think that escapism is, uh, Ragnarok was maybe one of the first moments where I felt like a draw to that level of escapism. Uh, and then Counter-Strike, uh, you know, original Counter-Strike, I played a lot of, uh, when I was able to, um, and just being really competitive and and being really good at that game and feeling good about that also made me feel, fall in love with it. That's cool. My parents were uh, not strict, but they did not like video games and I didn't have any myself. So I went to my cousin's house uh, in St. Louis when I was a little kid 
and uh, they had uh, Nintendo, which I'd never heard of before, and they had Excite Bike, Castlevania, and Super Mario Brothers, which are really cool. good games to be introduced to. Yeah, and I remember sure. Castlevania, especially just being like, "This is, you know, it, it was just the interactivity and stuff was amazing." But that's not my earliest game memories. I really wanted a Nintendo after that for sure, and I fell in love with it. My earliest was Zork, and 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 sitting at a, which is a text based adventure game, and uh, you know, ha- having you know, no, reading and writing skills, and you know, being in front of a really pr- primitive early computer with uh, a friend, and in this case, also my cousin. Uh, I would just spend hours like playing with that, and that's the the earliest interactive thing I remember, and and so that just, that drew me in because it was a story and because it was interactive and all these other ways that were not Nintendo. Like it's kind of weird. Yeah, Je- Justin, how about you? Well, it's interesting. Like I, video games have never not been a part of my life. I think we got the NES when I was five, and um, although it was a family gift, like it was mostly <laughs> mostly a gift <laughs> for Justin. And so, you know, Mario 1, 2, and 3, all the NES games, all the SNES and Genesis games, I've, I've never, ever not been with games. But I think the turning point for me was the launch of the Nintendo 64 and Mario 64. That was the very first time I remember two things happening. One, um, v- uh, you know, being a gamer and playing games formed a part of my core identity at, at around that age. Um, I was 12 or 13. So before that, it was like I played video games, but didn't give a lot of thought of like, what kind of person do I want to be? How do I want to outwardly like you're making choices in middle school about like, Mm -hmm. you know, what kind of person you're going to be. And it's the very first time I remember getting online and um, thinking about games and talking about them and being involved with that hobby outside of playing them. I don't ever remember, like I visited in 64.com and Nintendo.com and posted on the message boards. And, you know, 12 year old me was like arguing people with people about Mario and Turok the Dinosaur Hunter. And that was sort of a new take on, um, you know, like you think about all the people that like watch Twitch now, but don't play a game themselves, but they're still gamers. It's still like a core part of their culture. Right. And like, that was the turning point for me was around, um, around the launch of Mario 64 and, uh, thinking about that game all the time when i wasn't playing it that was new (laughs) yeah for sure um yeah i don't ever remember a time i don't remember not loving video games like sam was alluding to growing up in the early 80s arcade machines were everywhere they're in the uh uh, they're at the grocery store they're at the convenience store they're at the gas station they're at the pizza parlor they're at the burger joint they're just literally everywhere and when you're out and about that's how parents would like keep their kids entertained, give them a few quarters to go play uh, Time Pilot or Defender or Miss Pac-Man it's or like whatever handing it was. Them your phone. Handing them what? Your handing phone? Them yeah. Your phone. It's, yeah, it's the early 80s equivalent of handing your kid your phone. <clears throat> and the arcade machines are just like perfectly designed to capture the attention of children. They have these flashing lights and laser sounds are coming out of them. And there's this beautiful art on the side of aliens attacking Earth or a giant like Arnold Schwarzenegger commando dude firing a giant machine gun into a jungle. And I was like, oh, my God, this is so cool. This is what I want to be standing in front of this arcade cabinet forever looking at this. This is perfect for me. I love it. I love it. I love it. And I just, and that's just like that was my growing up. And like I've never like not lo- had that love in my life. Mm-hmm. I have a very cute picture of my daughters. We went to sort of a family-friendly tavern that has like a wall of arcade machines. So the adults are sitting there sort of sharing a drink. And then, you know, we're keeping an eye on our kids. And they're all, they have, I don't, (laughs) they had one stool and they'd somehow piled like four or five kids on this single stool to like look up and like, you know, look at whatever. I think it was like Killer Queen or, you know, some arcade machine. And I'm like, that was me. That was me 30 years ago, you know, when I was five. And um, we have a really cute picture of them all huddled around that screen. And um, I think certain experiences like that are pretty universal, aren't they? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I I should also mention, like, I loved Nintendo Power and EGM growing up. Um, When 2000 came around and I started reading IGN, I was super into games in a different way. I was into who's making what, what's coming out. I got really excited about what was coming out for GameCube and I was really into reviews. And like, that's where like my fandom really changed. I wasn't just like a kid that liked video games, like all my friends Mm -hmm. did. It became like, I like really started connecting with the culture of video games. And then when Kotaku and Joystick came around later, I read them like I read every article on those sites, like just cover to cover, basically for years. 
and I, I like just became completely obsessed and I really, really liked the coverage of games. Then I got into them that way too. So I think that was like a next level moment. You know, I had a similar Mario 64 one, like Justin did too. And then, and so like, you know, th- as things kind of notched up and that's when I decided like, I want to work in this industry too. Yeah. Yeah. Same. You can actually draw a direct line. Like I mentioned, I posted on the Nintendo.com forums or, you know, maybe even early IGN boards back then. And like, that was when I was just starting to discuss video games and I was, you know, 12 or 13, and I was writing for fan sites, like Nintendo fan sites, you know, Nintendo Joe and places like that. Three years later, like by the time I was like 16, and like there's a direct line, like a direct line between that and the work I'm doing now, because I wrote for free, you know, as a fan, and then started getting, you know, small freelance gigs as as high school, you know, as I was still in high school and, and winding into college. And like, it's not... Like I'm older now, but like there's no it's a it's a straight direct continuity from like from playing Mario sixty four to where I am today. Mm -hmm. I think there's like definitely a second phase of life to all of this where, you know, we got into the industry and fell in love with it in a different way. Um, And I started writing about video games when I was in college. Uh, and my first, like, you know, I'd been to E3 and done interviews and whatever else, but I was kind of like, you know, learning the ropes and, and being given the assignments no one else wanted because I was new um, and everyone else had like a little bit more experience than I did. But my first major preview and my major interviews um, were for Dragon Age Origin. Uh, and I had flown to Edmonton, interviewed the founders. And it was just this like, you know, major star uh, starstruck moment. Uh, and also the the kind of opportunity for me where I realized like there are other professionals in this industry, you know, at the time I was young. So I'm scratching it up to quote, to, uh, air quote professionals. Um, but you could talk to them about games on a level that I'd always wanted to. Like I want to dissect like this boss level or I want to talk about this storyline moment. And I didn't really like grow up with people who, uh, aside from my brothers, who were interested in talking about games on that level. So when I went to this week long preview event, uh, it just was a. It opened an entirely different world to me, uh, to this community where like I could I could speak about things on a level that people not only understood but reciprocated and added to, and it turned into like a genuine conversation. I was like, "Yep, yeah, this is this is what I'm going to be yeah. doing." I think that's really cool. You know, uh, before uh, I was in the industry uh, or anything like that, I listened to Game Scoop. <laughs> like before I ever great. worked at IGN or anything <laughs> like that. That's how long ago Game Scoop started. How far yeah, you've come? Really cool. And of course, I read Tina's bylines all the time in Kotaku. Yeah, all the time. Funny. Like I, yeah. I, I knew, I know the article. Like sometimes something comes up and we're talking. I'm like, yeah, I remember the article you wrote about that. It's really funny. <laughs> really, I had a moment. Like I read EGM was like my magazine growing up, and it was you know it was Dan Shu and John yeah. Davison. Who John Davison now you know we work together mm-hmm. every day with at IGN. He, he <laughs> yeah. works here now. And I, you know, Dan Chu and I aren't like close friends, but we know each other socially and like have a friendly relationship. And that completely like I, I still can't believe it it's still unbelievable to me that like that's where where we're at in 2020 now i know that's yeah. like the first time i met casa messina matt yep. Yeah, same. Like, yep. wow i just i can't i can't believe i'm meeting you i can't believe i work with you jeez yeah i, anyway. snuck, in, I snuck into an, <laughs> snuck into an e3 party and met all those guys one year so crazy uh tom's personal anecdote about falling in love with video games uh says even though it hasn't aged very well assassin's creed 3 because it sparked my interest in history and i am now studying to be a history teacher oh cool and that brings us to video game 20 questions our suggestion this week is from i think it's someone we got an email from brian from austin texas he's the one that asked uh about uh one sending one modern game back in time how do you got this? What are people playing there, Tina? Who knows? I haven't seen a human being in many months. <laughs> oh, because it's been off in Texas. Sorry. Yeah. All right. Well, then, let uh, a hometown boy for Tina. Let the questioning begin. Uh, does this game have to do with cowboys? No. <laughs> Define you cowboys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they wear hats and boots. <laughs> <laughs> That's so stupid. Aren't, aren't restaurants? <laughs> wait, wait. Aren't restaurants open? Can't you go eat at a restaurant right now, Tina? Yeah, restaurants are open at twenty five percent capacity, and if you've been in one longer than ten minutes, they have they take like a, a trail of record information from you so that they can trace any kind of um, developments of the disease. So you eat really fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or you just sit there and get everything <laughs> documented. Finished in nine um, minutes, like suckers. Yeah, <laughs> bars are open too. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Okay. No, it does should, not. Have I think to do you should Cowboys. still stay home, everybody. That's my advice to you. Three. All right. Uh, Post two thousand game. 
This was released yeah. after 2000, yes. Okay. Uh, is is it this on game? Yeah, that's Sorry. what I was going to ask. Is this on yeah. the Nintendo Switch? I love this yeah. one. Yes, it's on the Nintendo Switch. I don't think it actually helps us, but it is something that like I think of now, like because it just narrows the library to what is it, nine hundred games? Well, yeah, <laughs> I think it's totally helpful because this like it can't be like a really graphically nuts nutso game. Like, yeah, so it helps me. Mm. Was it originally on Switch? Yes. What? All right, let's get. Uh, we got this. Is uh, it? Can you hear my cat? Come here, kitty. Yeah. Is it arms? Uh, <laughs> no, you can't do that. <laughs> is this an indie game? Are there arms in this game? <laughs> is, is this, this an, an indie game? game? Yes. No, this is not an indie game. That's fine. It's arms. <laughs> I'm, I'm impressed with first? Damon's Damon's ability to like parse out our goof questions from our real <laughs> yeah. questions. I know. I know. Usually, he has to say, "Is this your final question?" Um, <laughs> is it? Is this a first party game? Yes. Ooh, wait. So that means it's get- a Nintendo game. Can you get in? Can you get this in single digits? Oh boy! Uh, does this game? Go does, does this game have Mario characters in it? No. It could be arms. <laughs> <laughs> um, is it part of? Oh wait, I was. was uh, this, is it? Go ahead, Justin. Was this game a new, like a new IP that made its debut on the Switch? Yes. <laughs> I was gonna say, is it part of like a well Nintendo franchise? <laughs> do you got um, do you got big stretchy arms? Have we game? mentioned this game yet? <laughs> have you mentioned this game yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Splat- Splatoon two. Yeah. Well, Splatoon one was Wii U. Was it's it? an IP know. new to to Switch though, so it's not Splatoon. Is that that's that's that was a yes to I, IP new to Switch, so. Uh, I really wanted so it to be. Soon one was on Wii U. I know that would have been great. Um, it could be, you know, the, the snipper clips. Mm. But yeah, there's a, yeah. other new Switch games. Yeah, I'm, I, there's not that much. Like, I mean, it could be one, two Switch. Mm-hmm. Uh, was this game released for like for sixty? Okay, was this a launch game? A launch game, as no, not a launch game. That's so ten. It's not- it's not Snipper Clips or One Two Switch. It could be the the ring game you put between your legs. Could be Ring Fit. Why did you phrase it that way? <laughs> I don't know the name of it. <laughs> what do you do with the ring? <laughs> it's true. Is well, you do other things. You do? Yeah. yeah, you also you also use your arms for it. So you do. Question kind of yeah, out. it's mostly arms. Probably. Look, it's not yeah. arms. <laughs> it's the first time we've ever got a just flat out no. Uh, is this game? <laughs> Does this game use a wacky peripheral? Yes. Is it is it a fitness game? Yes. Oh, wait, but there's I know it's Ring Fit, but there is there's <laughs> that there's the boxing one, right? What's the, the boxing one? I don't know. Maybe maybe that one doesn't use a peripheral. Is maybe this Ring Fit older. Adventure? Yes, Ring Fit Adventure. Thirteen <laughs> questions. Are you sure you do? You don't just put that. Uh, is, is I think the hands thing yeah. is cheating, right? It's like on the no. power no. pad when you get no. on the power pad, you hit no. it. It's cheating. No, you Justin put, has you, played this for like fifty hours. <laughs> But yeah, maybe, exactly. maybe he's cheating. Oh, plus B, no, that's A. Plus B, it's actually a Pilates ring, um, which I've done Pilates for many, very many years. You do put it between your legs uh, often, but it's it's very frequently like an arm specific. You do. Uh, exercise one of the, one of the Joy-Con stra- straps into the into the they call it the ring con, and then the other one straps to your leg, and so it's actually very clever. The one strapped to your leg knows if you're jogging in place, and then you're pushing and pulling the ring con to do you know shoot bows and arrows and do a bunch of crazy um, stuff. It's it's very based on resistance training. Yeah. And my my daughter plays it every day now because she, it's sad she can't get outside wow. to play very much. So mm. is she Do just like point? really buff now? She's a she's a, she's a really buff five year old. She's a buff baby. <laughs> is, buff Do baby. the rings break? That's an Adventure Time reference. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, they're made for that, Sam. Okay. They're made for putting I, between I, your I, legs. I think somebody at our work broke one. Mm. Only if you're a buff baby do you break them. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Justin's gone through like fifty. Well, <laughs> nicely job, everybody. Thank you for the suggestion. Brian from Austin, Texas. That is all the scoops we have for you this week. Uh, you can everyone, me, Brian. Everyone uh, here in the uh, good old US of A has a holiday weekend. Uh, we're going to be off tomorrow and Monday, but we will be back next Thursday with more Game Scoops. If you are in the United States, uh, hopefully you have an uh, enjoyable and relaxing holiday weekend. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Borba, behind the scenes. Thank you to Lion for making such a, an exciting cameo. 
Hey, meow somewhere in the back. My name is Damon. This is IGN Game Scoop, and we're out. No one said anything about my hat this whole time. I, like it. I thought Hello. it just said cops. <laughs> <laughs>